Okay, welcome everyone to the last lecture of the radio, uh, the radio day before we move on to the radio hands-on sessions after lunch. This lecture will be provided by uh, Pietro Zucca from the Netherlands Institute of Radio Astronomy. So Pietro uh, is, is a veteran of TCD astrophysics, did his PhD at the same time as I did there. And now he's uh, working in, the, in Astron um, on solar radio physics and solar space, radio space weather and uh, also a telescope operator of Blofar as well. So Pietro, um, as, as you've seen, there's some questions uh, throughout, if you don't mind, as well as a few at the end, um, if you don't mind taking questions during. Yes, of course. So okay. please yeah. feel free to, to ask questions uh, during the talk. First of all, thanks oh, okay. very much, Owen, uh, for uh, giving me the opportunity to present uh, this workshop. and. Um, I'm actually, indeed, as Owen said, um, did my PhD with uh, Professor Gallagher in, uh, in Trinity, uh, he, he, and, and now in Dias, of course. Uh, but um, it was a pleasure to see, of course, the, the lecture from Diana as well. They did an excellent, she did an excellent job to show the different types of radio bursts. And, uh, and of course, Owen, with this uh, amazing um, the the theoretical point of view on the radio emission, which really uh, sets us the scene here for um, giving a little bit of that perspective on the instrumental point of view of the observatories, or what instrumentation we use to observe such a large variety of uh, physical mechanism for the radio emission, and such a large variety of radio burst and phenomenon that we, we, we want to, to, to understand. So I'm gonna just brief, give uh, again uh, an introduction a little bit on um, what um, um, we're gonna um, do together in this hour. Uh, but I was asked to give a little bit of an historical perspective. So really uh, trying to uh, tell you a little bit about the old uh, instruments to observe the sun, how actually uh, radio astronomy for, for, for the sun or radio astronomy in general uh, started uh, with, of course, uh, the perspective of the solar physics. Uh, and then I will uh, give a little bit of an overview of present solar radio instruments. In reality, I will focus, of course, on LOFAR. As, um, as you know, Stellar is a project uh, that, of course, focuses on LOFAR. Um, and then a little bit of um, radio observations for solar physics and space weather. Some of the recent uh, results, again, with a focus on LOFAR. I will not talk about future instruments because I know that uh, um, Nicole Wilmer will give a very nice lecture as well, and she will talk about future instruments such as uh, the spin-off, for example, for LOFAR for space weather as well. Um, and so I will not focus on, on, on future instruments. Now, to start a little bit again with this, um, I mean, it was shown already uh, during the, re the previous talks, of course, but again, just to set up a, a scene on why do we want to build on the ground on Earth, why do we want to build radio observatories? Well, it's because it's the second largest uh, window that we can observe. Well, the first one it was, is, of course, the visible, the, the visible light. It arrives at uh, the surface because uh, the atmosphere of the Earth is mainly transparent for it. And this is why we developed our eyes, most likely, to observe that frequency range. Um, but of course, radio waves gives a, an important uh, alternative to study um, uh, astrophysics and, of course, uh, solar physics. So, and also they are easy instruments in, in a sense that, as Diana mentioned as well, I think she mentioned about the cost of LOFAR. If you think about the cost of LOFAR, which is uh, uh, in the order of uh, hundreds of millions, um, you're talking about a very cheap mission <laughs> with respect of any spacecraft that is launched. And uh, you're talking about um, an European or international collaboration where uh, just building different stations, we can really um, address many uh, scientific topics. One of, one of which, of course, is um, uh, solar physics. Now, I'm, uh, uh, so the sun can be active 
um, and dominant in many of these wavelengths, in fact, due to its proximity, every time that the sun is active, it's going to be brighter than any other uh, astronomical sources. This is, um, I, I was working during my, one of my previous postdocs uh, in uh, the Esperi project where we um, started analyzing Fermi data, so gamma ray data from the sun. And this was an image that they always uh, remi uh, remained um, uh, really um, uh, on, on, on on my memory, the fact that when the sun is active, even in gamma rays, that the sun is hugely bright, brighter than any source. And uh, of course, in radio, it's very similar. And if you look at this image here, that is, uh, there are two examples of a uh, single station image of uh, the sky. Well, you will see that the sun, when it's active, is really dominant. Um, I think this is Cas A and Cygnus A again, and the galactic. Um, uh, background. But you see, of course, the sun is bright also at these frequencies uh, of low far. So this is why we want to study the sun, of course, in, uh, in radio waves, because it, it arrives really at ground level. Um, and so you want to build instruments that are capable to do, to do so. But how all of this started? Well, the first attempt is attempt. I mean, in, in, if you look, I, I had to dig a little bit about uh, uh, this, but it seems that in 1890, there was really um, a letter from Kennelly. Kennelly was an engineer working for, for, for Thomas Edison, with Thomas Edison, let's say. And they sent a letter to the Lick Observatory, and uh, it seems like like that um, Edison <laughs> decided to be interested in solar physics, according to Kennelly's letter, and he wanted to uh, observe uh, electromagnetic disturbances uh, uh, from the sun. This was an attempt, of course, we don't have records uh, if the experiment was carried out or not, but in, 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 it, it's amazing to see that already at that early stage, people were thinking about the radio emission from the sun and the uh, possibility of recorded. Um, there is an, um, a recorded attempt, of course, in uh, from uh, Sir Oliver Lodge. We're talking about the end of the... Um, 1800s and um, but again they did not succeed to record um, uh, this emission. There is also, of course, uh, the European. Uh, uh, well, the European. There is also, of course, um, a French attempt. I think in 1901 in the French Alps as well, which was um, again um, unsuccessful. Um, another. Yeah, sure. the, the do you, do you know how they tried that? It was it with like a just a wire antenna or something yes. Simple. So apparently, we're reading the letter. Part of the letter from, of Kennelly, he said that he wanted. Uh, well, Edison himself wanted to try with um, a, a sort of uh, a bulk of wires. <laughs> mm. So they wanted to build what it what it is. Um, an antenna. Don't, let, let's not forget that uh, in those years, uh, some years after, actually, then there was, of course, the experiment of uh, uh, Marconi to try to 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 communicate, do transatlantic communication. So, if you if you look at those sorts of large antennas, they are either aerials on on sorts of balloons or or large structures of wires. Um, and um, and of course, like just speaking about the experiment of Marconi, he, he was very lucky uh, to to actually communicate because of the presence of the ionosphere. So that was the only reason why the experiment worked. Mm -hmm. um, but nevertheless, uh, uh, just exactly talking about the ionosphere, we are in 1902, and uh, and where one of the so the same Kennelly, which was the same engineer working for Edison. Um, discover well to, uh, to, together of course we um, uh, he designed but uh, he, he discovered the reflecting layer of, uh, of, of of the ionosphere which we now call the E layer and um, and and the fact that if they had tried the experiment they wouldn't have seen it because they were trying below 10 megahertz. So again, like it's important to put together <laughs> the, the, the different information and how the ionosphere, of course, is uh, relevant even nowadays for our observations. Um, if we move in with the years, um, we can also see that some about 30, 
30 years later, 35 years later, um, they were the first real recordings of uh, solar emissions. Um, probably this is not the first, but from what I could find, it's one of the first actually uh, radio fizzles, uh, they were called um, basically disturbances on the shortwave communication um, that were due at this frequency, so very close to the cutoff of the ionosphere, 20 to 4 megahertz, um, uh, where there were uh, the first real evidence of non-terminal emission. And I found this, this plot, which I find it amazing. In 1938, if you look at the, the, the plot on the top, to my knowledge, this is the first light curve of a type 3 radio burst, basically. It's about 14,000 kilo cycles, <laughs> so 40, 40 megahertz. Um, and, um, and down in the, in the plot below, you can see how um, the, the, the signal of the, the radio communication dropped at the same time where this um, emission from the sun occurred. So really, really nice to see these plots already uh, in the late 30s. And then, of course, there is the more historical known case about 1942, um, where Hay uh, in England detects uh, the sun, um, of course, in conjunction with, uh, you know, all the uh, military efforts for radio communication and rather for, for the war. Um, and, um, of course, all of these reports were kept silent for a while until uh, they were made public just after the, sometimes after the war, actually. And um, the efforts here of the radio community started to really see the two, um, the two uh, different um, efforts. So the microwave efforts, so 10 gigahertz, 3 gigahertz, you know, and then with, with, with simple horns uh, of large sort of uh, ear like um, antennas, they weren't dish, dishes yet. Uh, but, but um, and then of course the low frequency. So with like large aerials and lar large cables and, and sort of primordial um, um, dipoles. Um, again, just a couple of, 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 of notes really is like when they started also talking about circular polarization and I'm trying to really uh, understand that there is um, um, a, a, a circular polarized emission that comes from from the sun, uh, but also the fact that they started correlating the the radio noise with the sunspot activity. So it's starting to really um, base the fundamental, uh, you know, modern um, questions that we have for, for for solar physics and how radio emission helps us understanding eruptive phenomena, but also um, linking to other wavelengths, so optical, for example, or, or, or white light. Um, and uh, I kept this here, you, uh, you will see the last sentence here. The, sorry for the boring slides, but for this historical research, I didn't find many pictures or, or so anyway. Um, in 47, uh, according to what I found, there's also the French radio group uh, was founded in Medon. Uh, so, of course, uh, uh, it was also a very relevant, relevant here, uh, but uh, they were also um, starting to give, to, to, to get the idea of solar outbursts um, that occur later at lower frequencies than higher frequency, showing that we're starting to think about this corpuscular streams, outbursts, an emission uh, at the local plasma frequency. So really, really, really the idea of uh, the type three radio burst already coming up um, in, in, in the late forties. And uh, of course, then we have the, the, uh, the development of the dominant group for a while in Australia in the 1950s, Will, uh, Wild and McCready, of course, they developed um, well, they developed, they started using uh, radio spectrometers with seat swipe, uh, sweep frequencies. So they really like tuned the different frequencies at different times to start create what they were like uh, single frequencies, uh, um, uh, like curves basically, but they started to 
uh, put them together in what is uh, what we know now as the dy dynamic spectra. And they described uh, the, 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 with very original names, the first three types of radio bursts. They called type one, type two, and type three, uh, <laughs> which, um, which then we kept um, as, 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 as a name until now. And one of the things that really strikes me, I think this was uh, one of my, I, 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 if I remember correctly, also speaking with uh, uh, Professor Monique Peak time ago, that she mentioned to me that uh, uh, Jean Louis, Jean -Louis um, uh, Steinberg uh, attended URSI in Sydney in uh, 1952. Um, and um, he was really impressed by the new. Uh, 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 spec uh, spec spectrograph also by by Wild McCready. Anyway, just after uh, when he came back to Paris, uh, according to what I hear from uh, from from Monique, he was really uh, 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 impressed also um, about the need of finding a quiet place to build a radio station. And this is why the year after 1953, uh, the Nancy radio station was opened uh, about hundred and 70 kilometers south of Paris in a quieter area than Medon. And uh, just a couple of years after, the type 4 radio burst was identified uh, by using the, the, the 32 element um, in Nancy. So really, really uh, nice job to uh, find, uh, really to, 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 to continue this, uh, this classification of, of, the, of, the, of the radio burst. Is that, Pietro, is that isn't the precursor to the Nancy radio heliograph, is it a separate thing? Yeah, uh, so the Nancy radio heliograph, uh, 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 I think, I hope, uh, I don't say stupid things, but if, if uh, maybe Nicole is also online, can, can correct me, but I think the Nancy radio heliograph uh, is the result of an upgrade of the two east, west and south and north and, 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 um, and, and, and north south uh, sets of arrays. So I think it, it was born first with one one set of antennas yeah. that then were replaced and then there was the uh, the second part that was built. Um, uh, so the, yeah, the I modern think one is in the, the, set, modern, the modern one was like a, it, it, sorry, the two element one. Sorry. The T-shaped one is in the seventies, is it? I think so. From what I remember, I think so. It's it, it comes later. At the beginning, yeah. there was right. just one um, one uh, 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 thirty-two element. Uh, I think it was uh, uh, East West, if I remember correctly. But anyway, yes, indeed, the, the modern Nancy is the, the the result of an upgrade after, of course. And which, by the way, I'm very happy to say that Nancy is back operational, and uh, uh, you can uh, you can now retrieve the new data set that they're they're now observing again. So very very important. I will tell later about again new synergies with Loper, of course, that they are they're they're they're, they're back in place. Um, but nevertheless, just to continue in in view of time. Uh, uh, um, Yes, I'm already talking a lot. So uh, in 1967, of course, um, we're talking about the, 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 we pass from spectrometers to actual uh, instruments, heliographs to, to observe uh, the sun. And it's quite remarkable that they use the three kilometers uh, circle of uh, dishes uh, um, rather than a cross. So they use the circular uh, shape uh, set of antennas to observe uh, um, pictures of the sun at 80 megahertz. And um, also uh, relevant, the same here, they, uh, there was one of the first, uh, uh, if not the first the deduction of uh, the speed of the solar wind by using scintillation. So really, really uh, another important information. I found this video, which I found fascinating. It's a video of the Kulgora radio uh, heliograph. And you can see the circular a part of the circular shape of these antennas. Uh, um, and uh, you can see the receiver. There are basically two uh, polarization sets of dipoles. <laughs> so they look like small, uh, uh, what, what we have like small LBAs antennas basically, but they put them in the primary mirror 
Um, and this is, uh, was, uh, uh, it reminds me also of or Orfe, for example. I think it's, it's a similar similar uh, design when you have a log periodic on top. This, this is just the two sets. And you can see the control room at that time of the Golgoro Observatory. I think one of this, uh, McCready, I think. Anyway, uh, and the, the pictures were coming in cathodic uh, screens, but you can see the scan. And, uh, and these were some of the images where, where, where they construct the radio burst um, uh, there in control room in real time there these screens. So I really find it fascinating for that times. And um, um, they, um, they then uh, saved all these pictures in like uh, photographical uh, films. So they really recorded like a, like a movie um, and some of the data, of course, was also recorded in magnetic tapes and, and quasi-digitized, let's say. <laughs> um, but it, it, most, of, most of it was all an, an analog uh, recordings. So really, really, really fascinating. Um, but of course, uh, um, if you're talking about heliograph, radio heliograph, the Kolgora probably was one, one of the first examples, but then there are also non-dedicated instruments such as uh, non-solar dedicated instruments, such as, uh, for example, the Clark Lake Radio Observatory, the, um, but of course, the Gauri Bidanur uh, uh, array in India, we, of course, Nanse radio heliograph, and then, of course, modern instruments, um, uh, LWA, NWA, and, of course, uh, LOFAR. So really, it's, 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 it's fascinating to see how the techniques developed from like simple arrays for sp spectrographs only, uh, sometimes even a single frequency, to dynamic spectra, uh, sweep instruments, to the first heliographs that were um, just uh, northwest or, or, or of southeast um, sets of antennas, and then circular shapes like the Kulgoro one, to then phase the rays such as um, LOFAR or L LWA or NWA. There are some very nice images, of course, uh, from the VLA of the sun. Um, and um, we're talking about the, the 80s. There were very nice images, of course, um, taken with a v VLA at uh, one or four gigahertz. Of course, Nobuyama in, 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 in Japan. And uh, this is an image, uh, I think, uh, late 80s or early 90s of uh, some radio emission at different frequencies uh, from uh, Clark, Lake, uh, Clark Lake Radio Observatory. And of course, um, the, the, the Nancy radio heliograph is starting uh, really to, 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 to lead here this, uh, in these years. Uh, 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 also because uh, Kulgora uh, is no longer operational and, um, and also the possibility of really having many frequencies, uh, six, uh, uh, six uh, different, uh, six I think, yeah, six different uh, frequencies from 150 megahertz to almost 500 megahertz. And this is an example from the paper of uh, Dalmiro Maya, where uh, again, another example of a CME uh, being observed. Uh, um, and so a very, very, very nice example um, again. And of course, now we arrive to uh, LOFAR. Now, LOFAR is the low frequency uh, array, and uh, it's of course non-solar dedicated. It's, it's dedicated to many different uh, key science projects, but uh, one of which is the sun, and it is, uh, of course, our favorite. <laughs> Some of the early videos um, that uh, I've produced in interferometric were about 2018. Um, where you can see here we weren't correcting for the ionosphere um, yet. Just, just, just a couple of, of things that I want to make you notice. Say, if you look at the 80 megahertz, you can see that when the type 3 radio burst is bright, we lose information on the quiet sun. When the type 3 uh, intensity goes away, then we see back the quiet sun. So we have a problem, of course, of dynamic range. We can't observe the quiet sun and the non-thermal emission at the same time. But you can see that if you calibrate, and it's very complicated, I will tell you about later, but if you calibrate the remote stations, then your beam size is quite small. And so we have 
some hope to see, um, you, you see the 80 megahertz emission blob is not that big to be um, 80 megahertz. So of course, if you look at the 20 megahertz, it's larger maybe as much as the sun. And uh, if you don't correct for the ionosphere, it's moving all over the place. And if you look um, at the beam size, then it's, it's, it's much larger. But these were some early attempts. But before moving forward, I just uh, given that we're having an instrumental uh, perspective, I'm just going to show you a little bit about uh, quickly about LOFAR. So LOFAR is um, the, the core of LOFAR. It's called the Super Turp. It's an island of about 300 meter diameter at the uh, inside of which there are six stations based off um, uh, LBAs and HBAs antennas. Uh, two pairs of small HBAs ears for each LBA arrays for the core stations. Um, and uh, they record from about, let's say, the ionospheric cutoff, so 10 megahertz, to about uh, 88 megahertz for the LBA, and then again from um, uh, 108 megahertz to about uh, 240 megahertz for the HBA. They are in two filters in reality, so you can maybe uh, image only with one filter or the other. So let's say up to 180 megahertz for the imaging if you choose the, the, the lower filter. Um, it's a fully digital telescope. That means that there are no moving parts. It's a, it's a phased array. So in order to steer, observe one part of the other of the sky, you apply digital delays. Or in the case of HBA's primary pointing, it's an analog, analog uh, beam. So there are like electronic boards where you have cables printed in the circuit with different length and then by choosing one of, of the other circuit you're pointing at different uh, parts of the sky. In old telescopes you would have physical longer cables uh, uh, for, for the different uh, antennas in order to, 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 to steer and to uh, look at different parts of the sky. So again a little bit of uh, uh, maps uh, very quickly. I'm not doing time, so I'm about half the talk. Yes. So um, if you talk about the international stations, together with, of course, the elements of the core and remote that they are in the Netherlands, we have many other international stations. One which will build um, in about a year and a half or two years in Italy. Uh, which will be possibly one of the first LOFAR 2 upgrades. Uh, so a little bit uh, different than the, than the than LOFAR 1 uh, stations. And then hopefully, given that we are uh, along Stellar, I added this uh, point popping up in Bulgaria. We want to see that, uh, that dots uh, happening <laughs> hopefully soon enough. Um, and uh, so regarding the data flow, just quickly, I don't want to, to, to go in details on this uh, because I want to also show many of the other solar results. But um, what I want to tell you here is that it's a fully um, soft, software telescope. So the, 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 the data collected from the different antennas at different stations, um, there is a, some pre-processing that happens at the cabinet of uh, each of the stations. but the majority of the computing is done uh, at the correlator, Cobalt, which is um, um, just a kilometer north of where I'm sitting right now here in Groningen. It's a huge supercomputer based on GPUs, graphic processors, that uh, basically just crunches the numbers, sums up all the information coming from the different antennas. And then we have a production cluster called SET4 that uh, start processing this correlator data and uh, creates uh, the various uh, uh, pipelines and records data. And the, the data then is sent to these various uh, long-term archives. Long-term archives, which uh, store a large number of data. We're recording seven petabytes of data every year for LOFAR, and they are recorded in magnetic tapes. And uh, you can see here, if you compare the, 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 the archives for astronomy, uh, LOFAR is by far the largest. We're reaching, I think at the moment, the numbers are that we are reaching, I think this is an old slide, but we're, we're more than 40 petabyte of data. Of course, LOFAR is not solar dedicated. We have many KSPs. Uh, 
uh, our favorite, the solar physics and space weather, of course. A um, bunch of uh, happy people that works to uh, create um, and uh, analyze the, 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 the radio data for the sun. Why is the radio data important? I don't go into details on this because it was uh, largely uh, explained in the beginning, but all I want to say is why radio data gives us an important overview of all of the high energy process happening on the sun. If you have magnetic reconnection in these two D cartoons, it is not explained very well, but it gives us an idea. You have a reconnection, particles are accelerated, they stream down and they fill up these loops that you can observe in microwave. This is a nice example from Nobiyama in 17 gigahertz, where you really see this, this loop, this, this loop <laughs> glowing in microwave. At the same time, when you have magnetic reconnection, you are also accelerating a magnetized blob of plasma that starts rising into the atmosphere. Not always, but anyway, if the CME appears, then you have the creation, of course, um, in the CME of the, the type 2 radio burst, but in open field lines, if these are accelerated, then you have type 3 radio burst. So again, electrons escaping open magnetic field lines. And the type 2 uh, signature of shocks from higher density to lower density as the plasma frequency de decreases with high. So here in one slide, you really understand a little bit of how Radio diagnostic is really important to really um, put, put numbers or all the all, all these energetics and imaging. If you are imaging, for example, with a non say radio, radio heliograph, you can see uh, those frequencies, the low corona, and with LOFAR, we extend this uh, this uh, view of the corona higher up. And uh, these, of course, are the types of radio bursts. I'm not going into to, to details, but just to understand from type 3, the signature of electrons escaping open B field lines, type 2, signature of shocks, trapped electrons of post flare loops, or as Diana was saying, much complicated physics, for example, for the moving type 4. You have also the type 4. Really, so in a single dynamic spectrum, in a single image you get such a variety of different phenomena. So what are we doing with LOFAR? With LOFAR we're observing at the same time in beam formed and interferometry and of course one of the challenges at the moment of the team, many of the team, uh, uh, many colleagues in, in, in Dublin of course are now working again uh, together with us to try to calibrate the remote stations and these are really uh, challenging uh, because uh, they're not in the same clock as the core stations but if you compare the beam size of course of just the core stations or the beam forming during with only the core station and the interferometry and you compare it with the with what we can see with the the remote stations of course a lot of noise, if you look at the PSF, a lot of noise because it's not well calibrated, but the beam shape is really, really, really small. So we could, in theory, uh, observe uh, much smaller features. In this so example just, here... Yeah, I yeah. just want to uh, ask the, frequency, the previous slide. Yeah. Um, oh, 46 mega. So I'm looking at the, the top right image in, in, in the image array. Uh, and the, the, the 46 megahertz source is actually pretty small. Uh, the yeah, I mean, kilometers is pretty good, yeah. It's pretty good. If you are able to calibrate well, you will see a nice image. Um, yeah. Of course, also, this was a storm of fine type trees. For example, mm. I will tell later the case uh, that Pierce looked, which was also very interesting, but it was a single isolated type three, which looked already in the dynamic spectrum much larger. And he saw a, a little bit of a larger source, but uh, probably we need to select to continue. And this is very interesting also for Pete, maybe to do the same fitting uh, with, with smaller, smaller uh, type trees or even S bars, for example, that they seem to be uh, very, very thin. Anyway, we'll talk about this later. But, but nice there, is, image, there is yeah. hope indeed that, uh, that we can see some more compact sources, especially if you look at the harmonic emission. Um, but of course, everything has a limit in the sense that if you plot, if you take like uh, this, this, 
these figures were prepared uh, the, uh, by, by, by P. Jean, where, where we're preparing this paper, where we are um, uh, using uh, the information uh, of the quiet sun before one of these type trees, we're subtracting the quiet sun from the, from, from the type tree. So we're left only with the radio burst. And then we plot the amplitudes at different uh, um, UV distances. And we can see that uh, indeed, we can see amplitudes up to about 35 kilometers. And after everything is most likely mm -hmm. scattered. Sorry to interrupt um, yeah. you. Oh, um, Carmen had a question there. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Hey, yeah, I, it, it was, I, I'm interested to, to learn a, a bit more about the, the process of, uh, of developing the images. I mean, do you do some sort of iterative clean uh, type of, uh, of algorithm or how do you get to, how do you ensure that you get the best, you know, dynamic range or signal to noise for each of those images that, that you've produced? Yeah, so I think that uh, Kira and Owen will be uh, giving you this afternoon also a nice uh, tutorial for that. But um, with uh, I know, for example, recent NPs, of course, but I know, for example, recently with Kira, with one of the uh, the latest uh, uh, paper for the top three, is that you really need to look at the right corrections for. Uh, um, uh, for the calibrator, when the calibrator itself is not affected by the sun. And most of the time, then what you do is that you need first to uh, remove the effects of the, of the, of the ionosphere and then uh, to um, put everything into the same clock because <laughs> the stations on, 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 on the remote stations are not in the same clock like the core. So if you take a snapshot with the core, they work fabulously, you get the image and they're nice. Of course, you have only three kilometer baselines. But if you want to add the baselines, then you need to really work for each amplitude understanding uh, um, making sure you're correcting uh, uh, right and using the, the, the right model. And in terms of the, uh, the dynamic range, say, for example, if you leave a, a, a baseline which is not corrected well, you will really see your image completely dissolving, disappearing, it's mirroring out. It's like right. so, <laughs> such a mess every time with your remote stations. Right, um, yeah, my, qu my question was more about, I mean, the, 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 the cleaning, yeah. I mean, do you, do you have some sort of iterative um, algorithm? Is there a yeah. way to, 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 to look for the best dynamic range? Yes, for that we're using uh, WS Clean. Mm -hmm. And WS Clean, um, you can have um, multi-scale cleaning, for example, where you're really uh, trying to um, you don't fix the number of iteration for the cleaning, but you wait until the residuals are small enough to be discarded. Um, but probably this is a nice uh, follow up for this afternoon when we are actually making the images with. Uh, just no, just to say, Pietro, we're not doing imaging in the radio. Oh, sorry, sorry. This afternoon, um, we will be doing it uh, in later workshops. You know, uh, next year or so. But Cameron, if we, we do have pipelines and codes and so on on GitHub, if you want, ever wanted to take a look at how the steps we take, we can pass them on to you. Okay, thanks. Yes. And of course, Cameron, in two weeks' time, you have the workshop in Astron as well, where we follow up on uh, really hands on, on on the images as, as, well, as well, if you want. And, um, and of course, you have uh, uh, um, you're, you're you're free also to we follow up on on, on more technical uh, uh, questions. But just in view of time, I want to uh, hopefully I will manage to finish the talk. So I have to speed up a little bit. But to continue on this, if you get a very nicely calibrated remote station set and you observe something like this event, which is really a very nice event that includes with LOFAR type threes, type ones, type fours, type twos. There is everything in one single uh, uh, observation. And if you just concentrate on the type four, this is a work in progress with uh, Liu et al. Um, we, you can really see that if you plot uh, 150 megahertz with LOFAR, and you plot it at the same time with Nancy, uh, we started to see the, 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 the double source where the finer structure, where the type four starts to detach from the active region. 
Um, I, I will tell you later, but um, if we look at this video, it's still a mess, but because there are all the frequencies together, but all I wanted to show here is that you have, uh, let me do again, because there was a discussion with Diana about the type one. So you see the type one that is happening here, it's happening here. It's completely unrelated with this, the active region. So it's really not the same. The type one is here, the, the source of the type three is here with the active region here, but the, and the type one comes back. This is the type one back, but it's unrelated with the active region. This is where the type three forms. And then you have some other instability here, but what happens now is that you have the type four that starts now to be nicely, all the frequency are nicely one on, 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 uh, superposed on the other. And then the type four starts to emerge and goes higher up, higher up. Some frequencies here are gone, so it goes back to the active region, but the majority here is going up, 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 and then we are left only with the two subbands of the type 4 here. And if you look this in context of the uh, CME, the CME is higher up, so what we're seeing in the type 4, in the moving type 4, is really uh, where the magnetic fields are anchored and how the CME itself is stretching all this magnetic structure away and you see the top of the uh, probably very close to reconnection point or where you have um anyway this uh, electrons being accelerated and you are seeing the moving type four slowly about 200 kilometers per second going up while the cme is much 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 faster 600 or more kilometers per second but what I wanted to show you in view of time is that if you look at the type four here and you zoom in, well, you start to see fine plasma structure similar to what we see in high resolution to the type two, for example. It seems to us that we have a superposed background, a very faint, I thought, I, I think gyrosynchrotron, but anyway, a, a very faint continuum. But then you have a lot of plasma small features all over the place that makes the brightness temperature so high so if you look just an image you you say oh br brightness temperature super high it's plasma or something else not gyrosynchrotron but what we want to, to show is that also there is this continuum and if you zoom in on the features it, it it's almost like um without any intensity if you compare it to the to the small plasma features. And I will tell you later in the paper of uh, Magdalene et al, these sorts of little plasma bl blobs are really similar even to what you see to type one, even you what you see to the fine structures of type two. So it's really like looking that, if you look at very high detail, you are seeing really the, 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 the plasma emission seems to be similar for many of the type of radio bursts, but the shape is different. And I will tell later a little bit about the shape of the type two as well, with um, some very recent work, for example, from uh, Kira uh, Megar as well. But okay, so I need to go quite quick because I, I think I have only 15 minutes left. So I'm just gonna rush it a little bit and then we, we, we go for the questions because sorry, I took a lot of time um, for, for the first part. But if you look, that, say for example, at uh, pairs of type threes, this is a type three B pair, uh, people from Beijing um, last year. Uh, what I wanna say here, it's simply the, the, this, that if you look at the harmonic, uh, well, if you look at the fundamental emission, the first three uh, images here, one, two, three, uh, hope you can see my cursor. And uh, the these are the fundamental. And you can see how large it is, but you can see also how erratic they are back into the image. When we are here at this point, the blob is just moving all over the place. Um, and, and if you plot here in this area, you see the, the position of the, 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 the apparent position of the, the fundamental is completely erratic. But if you look at the at the harmonic, well, the harmonic is very, very stable a lot for minutes after. So again, there is hope that uh, given that uh, the harmonic is far away from the fundamental plasma frequency is not so affected by um, radio wave propagation. And of course, this beautiful example for from peers, um, they studied a more isolated um, type three where there were nice, type three structure, but it was still an isolated um, type three. 
Um, but Pierce did a very excellent job on estimating from the, let's say, the modulation of, let's say, from the individual striation of the type, the type three. He estimated that the source size of what he should see is about three to four arc seconds. But by fitting with the lower visibilities, he found that they are much larger. The source is about um, eighteen to ten arc minutes. And again, there, what's happening here? Is it because we're we're looking at fundamental emission? superposed to the harmonic and then it's like in the paper of Beijing completely erratic and, and enlarged should we try to have uh, so there are many questions and interesting um, results uh, that, that we can have a look on how to select uh, with this method fitting a new v plane but other uh, radio bars like that the, the, they are in principle smaller for example s bars or type 3 storms and on the, the, the defined structure, just to go to, to mention a very nice paper from uh, Yasmina Magdalene last, uh, last year, when she looked at the plasma, and uh, these ones, if you zoom in in the type two, they look much, much similar to what we see zooming in in the type four. So to me, it's fantastic to see that probably the fundamental plasma emission, these blobs <laughs> are similar, but then they create like a mosaic, different types of radio burst. And I'd say that, for example, because with the recent work with Kira that I will mention, but before going to the recent work of Kira with the type two, I wanna see, I wanna tell you about what, in about 2014, this event where using only Nanse, we had only, if you see like one, two, three, four, five frequencies that were spanning across this. But already looking at the complexity of the type twos, in this case, there were different drifts, for example. And with limited frequencies of, of Nancé, we were already able to see how the, the, the radio burst changes uh, direction or uh, changes along this, uh, this type two depending on the conditions where this is generated. And uh, for example, in this other work of 2018, when we're looking just at 80 megahertz, for example, we wanted to create uh, alpha and speed maps where we understand the, the actual conditions. And I have to rush on this, sorry, but what I, what Diana, I think in, she mentioned it this, mo this morning. When you see the speed of the, the, the um, when you see the speed of the CME, the fastest speed is of course of the apex, but the radio emission is not happening at the apex. When you look at the Mach number, of course, here there was a large streamer that made this, this region of Mach number higher because of the density. But again, the highest Mach number are here and the radio emission is not happening there. The radio emission is happening for a combination of the three phenomena, which are the speed, and of course the Mach number, but the uh, orientation of the magnetic field. When you have also a quasi perpendicular situation, then you have your radio emission. This movie a little bit explains it all. Uh, well, you have a streamer here, dense region, you have magnetic field aligned like this, so quasi perpendicular, and you have the CME that starts to interact with this dense region, and boom, here we have the radio emission. So with a combination of the uh, speed uh, theta, the, 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 the field geometry and the Mach number, these are the conditions where you form the radio waves. And just to run into this beautiful paper that Kira published last year, uh, no, what, what I'm saying last year, this year, the beginning of this year, uh, Maguire uh, 2021, uh, she looked, um, I helped a little bit, but she looked at uh, the very beautiful uh, type two uh, series. There were two nice type twos. One happened here before you have a first jet uh, and you have a type two fundamental and harmonic. And as you can see, um, similarly to what Magdalene et al. So there are many little plasma components and lanes. I think um, Yasmina classified it as splitting of the splitting or others. What we're seeing here with Kira is that depending on the condition uh, of the, the local condition where this jet is, is formed, you have, of course, nice different um, uh, radio emissions, which are more than lanes, they look more chaotic. But 
And this is just in preparation, so I cannot show more than just this dynamic spectra. But Kira is now preparing a second paper where you have the second type two, which this case, it's not happening in the first uh, jet part, but in the spray here, just after. And look how more complex is this EUV spray and how more complex is the emission of the type two. It's not a simple lane. It's not a simple band split lane. It's not a simple band split of the band split. It looks like a tree where there are lanes at different positions all over due to the fact that you have, similar to, to, to what I was showing here, when you have a streamer, a dense region and a CME, so a, 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 a shock, and then it encounters uh, just here simply a dense region. Here, it's happening that this blast wave is passing through this complex plasma. And it, makes la lanes, very complicated lanes for the type two. But I won't say more because this is still the current preparation and, and of course, but I wanted really to show it here because it's beautiful how the type two and what we think a simple backbone or herringbone, uh, backbone or, or splitting, it doesn't apply anymore when you have such a high resolution and frequency resolution and time resolution to image all of what's happening in these complex radio bursts. Pietro, can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. Uh, about those figures. Um, so uh, from the EUV observations, these seem like very low uh, down close to the surface of the sun features. Um, yeah. But the, the frequencies are, are quite low at the same time for both of these events uh, yeah. during the, the snapshots that you're showing. I, I assume those black lines correspond to the, um, to the times when the EUV observations were made. Yeah. Um, can you say something about that? I mean, these seem like they should be much higher frequency. I will probably let 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 let, let Kira later in the in uh, um, answer more in, in details. I don't want to <laughs> I don't want to um, spoil the the, the, the the new results. But 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 what I what I think that, that that that's happening here is indeed if you look at the frequency and I didn't show here all the the nice imaging that Kira is preparing because they're not published yet. But um, I, I do expect that the first type two uh, sort of um, um, happens in a, in a little bit different location than the, 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 the second one, but also that the second one is um, um, not really happening at the uh, plasma frequency of the quiet corona. So you would say, oh, why at 40 megahertz we're not seeing higher up? But it's really a local uh, plasma density due to the fact that you have uh, sprays coming up and you would have a situation where the plasma was evacuated before by the previous event as well. So you really see these low frequencies. And also remember that we're also seeing a projection effect. So it could be a little bit higher up. Uh, towards us, but um, they, they, they appear cl closer to the, to, to the limb. But anyway, if you apply a simple uh, density model of the height of the plasma, it never works. You can even see when, when Owen this morning showed the image from the NBA, uh, NWA, you have the, 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 the theoretical plasma shell uh, the, uh, with the density, and then you have uh, mission blue all over before and after. So it's really complex, of course. But what strikes me on this nice event, um, that you know when you see the radio image the radio sources in low far or maybe Kira do you want to say um, where they are with respect to the jet? Yeah, just I say in particular I suppose for the event well it's it's the same day but kind of corresponding to two different features that you see in your EUV there particularly the, say the one on the right we corresponded that type two with the jet that you see emerging radially um, and I suppose what to keep in mind is that. The, the shock isn't necessarily going to be right above the jet and it depends on what type of shock is in question and what we found is imaging when we when we actually imaged the fundamental it was displaced with respect to the harmonic due to scattering so if we kind of only look at the harmonic because that's not scattered so that's giving us a better proxy for the location of the shock i think it was about 0.2 or some ahead of the jet um 0 0.2 0 0.5 i can't remember specifically and, and propagated outwards. So that kind of gives us a clue to the type of shock that it was, that it was a, a kind of piston driven shock. Um, but that you, you don't really see that in the EUV images and it's, it's not, you don't see any white light in this region. Um, so it's, even though the, we, I guess we don't necessarily expect to see the shock right at the density or the height that you, you see your, um, the driver of the shock. It kind of gives you a good holistic view of it. Mm. Thanks, Kira.
Thanks. Indeed. Thank, th thanks so much, Kira. And I, 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 of course, am not showing any of these uh, radio images. You will show it in, in your, in your uh, fu fu future talks. But I just put the dynamic spectra here to show the complexity of, of these events and how it looks like similar to really the EUV plasma features that they are there. Uh, it looks like the type two is propagating and ignited at different locations where you know, what's a perpendicular situation plus Mach number uh, uh, are, are, are are allowing the radio emission to be created. So it's simple, simpler visions before when we had blurred dynamic spectra, it, it was like, okay, it's a lane that drifts. It's much more than that. It's multiple lanes. It's, it's, it's like lanes that are ignited here and there. Sometimes even when you see a lane that looks together, it's not. It's actually uh, um, the, radio the radio emissions coming from different locations that now we can actually resolve and see. So beautiful, beautiful uh, work uh, to, and, and, and many, many, many beautiful um, questions that come, but really, what striked at me when I saw this, it was like, we really had a simplistic view of say type twos, or they are really much more complex than uh, that, 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 that what we think. And when we start seeing in, 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 in high resolution, both the dynamic spectra, these different features, then classifying all of them and uh, the simple explanation of band splitting, for example, or the single explanation of, um, multi multi lanes uh, that they're, they're all that, that is a lot that is a lot to 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 understand so really really low for yeah, coming so, sorry to interrupt um we're coming up on time now can maybe another five minutes if you can oh, right so for another five minutes then i run these are the 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 the, the complex modes that we use with lofar at the moment so it's not a simple interferometric only but we also have observations of uh, pulsars and quasars around. Uh, Richard Fellows will give you a very nice IPS uh, overview. But just to go into link into that, um, I'm just going to show a little bit of what LOFAR does at the moment and the observations of AKSP. So from uh, interferometric and beam forms of the sun, where you observe the electron beams and the shock waves and acceleration due to, um, for example, um, yeah, shock waves, so type twos and etc. Type fours, which is very in interesting as well. Um, uh, but then we also um, observe uh, the magnetic field or the scintillation that the, the, the CME itself generates uh, passing in front of uh, compact sources. And this is what um, Richard will tell you uh, in the following days. Um, and then the solar wind uh, density and speed, of course, but also studies of the AMSV. I'm not going to go into details of this slide because uh, uh, Richard will tell you about it and also this very beautiful um, CME uh, passing uh, in front of uh, quasars, basically. You can see it uh, with scintillation, you can see the increase of density and speed uh, with the scintillation. We can also, of course, use this property, the dispersion measure from pulsars. Well, what we see is that the, the light coming, the radio waves coming from, uh, from, uh, from pulsars, if you have a plasma and uh, so you will see the high energy first, and then a little bit later, the uh, low energy. So you have a dispersion in frequency. By measuring this dispersion of the different frequencies, you can get an estimation of the density of the plasma. And uh, Katerina published a nice work last year where she uh, analyzed loads of pulsars where they were approaching the sun, sometimes going behind the sun and then jumping on the other side and uh, showing how the density increase when it's closer to the sun and decrease again when it's... So it's basically just mapping the density of the solar corona and the heliosphere. Uh, recent works, uh, Katerina is working uh, with the KSP, of course, uh, group uh, and the Euphoria group to uh, use this uh, pulsar observations, uh, mainly for density um, and uh, to, to, to compare with models such as the Euphoria model. But because it's very difficult to find CMEs, Katarina is now also looking at streamers. So when the pulsars are on top of streamers and understanding if we can indeed see this excess of density. 
a nice, 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 nice uh, promising result to finish on the Helios Day, from the sun to the Helios Day, is uh, the work of Maria Bizi and uh, of course Richard and uh, Katerina and, and they're all working into uh, extracting also the uh, rotation measure for, um, for, for when CMEs are passing. This is a very promising result uh, where you can see the excess uh, of uh, rotation measure and dispersion measure when a CME passes in front of this line. So, so really, really exciting times. And uh, Gollum is also working with Katerina uh, into now trying to use more historical data sets and where we are trying to put all the pulsar observations together and uh, seeing when uh, with a code where eventually some CME passed in front of the line of sight during the observation. And because it's very complicated, we're also working on modeling. So using models of the actual flux rope of the CME uh, by, for example, the group of Christian Moss, where we can just, because we have only sometimes one pulsar, so we want to know what's the predicted uh, B field or density of that uh, particular line of sight to compare with what we see with the pulsar. It's all very pre preliminary, but I wanted to plug it in here because really the heliospheric part of the heliospheric com component uh, uh, or the low the even the low corona um, applications with LOVAR are so really amazing and um, the study of the radio burst and the fine structure together with all these applications um, I didn't even mention the ionosphere but there is so much to do with LOVAR it's such a, a complex instrument and that's why I wanted to put you uh, here in also the part. And I conclude what, with, 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 a, with a, a design study. I'm not uh, really involved because it's more an engineering part where they are designing the antennas for this uh, disturb uh, spectrographs um, in collaboration with the military here in the Netherlands, where basically they are designing antenna and they, they, they finished disturb one and they're starting now the, the disturb two, where a prototype of this uh, solar radio spectrograph completely based on phase arrays from LBAs to sort of HBA type to very high frequency phase arrays to three gigahertz, not using dishes, but phase arrays for this. So really wonderful work of the engineers uh, for, for the antenna settings and um, Michiel branches that it's uh, leading this project that they are starting to build in the backyard here in Astron, some of these antennas to test a prototype of, uh, of, of, of this large fre uh, frequency range for 20 megahertz to 10 megahertz to a couple of gigahertz, three, four, five gigahertz spectrograph. So really cool. And we can actually use this data whenever it would start also for science. So not only for, 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 for the military to, to, to have a knowledge of the radio burst. And this is a little bit how it works, but that's it. Uh, I hope that I wasn't not too late in time. So thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you, Pietro. That was really great. Great, I'd and I love the historical overview and those those movies. I think it was Clark Yates. Yeah, Make you show are just amazing. Um, yeah, oh, so Clark, we, yeah, 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 yeah. Eating into lunch, I guess. But maybe we have time for one quick question. If there's any for Pietro. No. Um, if not, I guess you can also catch oh, Pietro. Yeah, I, I, I have one question. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I just needed to unmute. So, Pietro, when you showed this uh, uh, multi frequency uh, uh, spectrum of the, I mean, the white band frequency spectrum of the different types of bursts uh, from the sun, somewhere in the middle of your presentation. Yeah. <sighs> Uh, okay, not that one yet. Yet that one. So have you uh, have you done this in in polarized uh, polarized um, yeah. intensity? Yeah. I was actually feeling very guilty that um, as KSP, where I think Diana starts to 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 work for the polarization on 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 some uh, tidal ray beam, but for the imaging, I personally never never plot other than Stokes Eye are starting to try because I actually seen some footage from from the 70s of the Pulgora and they were they, they were plotting already the, 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 the red and green uh, colors of a type 4 and they were showing the food the food point with different polarization I said like 
Why are we not doing this? Because if we plot this with LOFAR now, I would have been very curious to plot the polarization. What we're doing with, with, uh, with Onkvil, for example, for this paper is we're looking at the polarization in the dynamic spectra. And uh, I'm sure there's a lot of work here for the future generations to really start, instead of plotting plot Stokes I, finally, as they were doing already 40 years ago, to plot the polarization. And the reason why we didn't do that yet is because looking at polarization with these phased arrays, uh, when you don't have like, the, before they're like dishes, they had dishes, they moved, even if they're in circular shape or T shape, they're dishes, they know exactly what's coming and what's the beam shape. The beam shape of your antenna doesn't change because it's a solid dish. <laughs> um, for us, the beam shape changes with the, depending on where we are plotting, uh, where you are pointing, but also, um, you can imagine that you, if you have even just a cro two cross dipoles and you want to have a very nice uh, polarized, uh, uh, di 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 different polarization to observe the stokes. We're having spillage of stokes from stokes I to Q, from stokes V to U. It's, it's really, really complicated. But now they're working on the holography to define the beam shape of LOFAR really depending on the frequency on the set, subset of antennas and also where we are pointing on the sky. Once we have this holographic nice representation of the beam and we can correct very well for, for, for having a nice um, polarization, uh, polarizing for information. At the moment, if you plot the other stokes rather than I with interferometric mode, for example, you will see that the image is, doesn't simply calibrate well. Um, I've spoken a little bit with a group of magnetism because they, they can help where they're looking at spiral rotation, for example, for galaxies. Um, but they're looking at snapshots of not very dynamic things. We're looking at something which is very bright, close to us, and it's changing in milliseconds, not, not even seconds. So it's really complicated. But really the goal on the next couple of years, I will hope in the next five, Here's Max to have a nice polarization imaging, not only Stokes I, and that will solve many more questions. For example, many more questions, for example, for the type four. We really need to start working yeah, on that. Yeah, I was asking because some of these um, uh, different types of birds, they show different types of polarization and you can easily distinguish, for example, where you say, uh, maybe this is uh, a type of birds to be imposed on uh, Polarization will give you an answer, I guess. Absolutely. Or at least partially. So. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I agree. And we're late on that. Um, and it's 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 mostly due to the instrument itself. It's a oh. I mean I can assure you that uh, any other yes, uh, sure. KSPs they're having problems as well for the polarization. Since we're um 15 minutes past, uh, oh, 15 sorry. minutes late. Can Maybe I suggest if you want to chat about it in Slack, we can. And then we can take our break now. Um, uh, I don't know, Shane, do you want to start 15 minutes late on the schedule? I don't mind. Uh, I mean, yeah, it, it's, yeah we can. I mean, it makes no yeah, sense. I, I guess since we're 15 minutes past time, we, we'll just go for uh, a break for one hour and um, meet back here at quarter to. And good. Okay. Okay. Um, thanks everyone. And as usual, you can get people in the Slack if you have more questions or discussions. So we'll talk to you in one hour. All right. Thanks guys. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks guys.